Steve Jobs lit the fires of his computer revolution and redefined the industry. He was, without any irony, one of the most brilliant men to come out of Silicon Valley. But Steve Jobs was also famously petulant. A terrifying boss who would publicly humiliate employees who got on his bad side. He also refused surgery after his pancreatic cancer diagnosis, choosing instead to fight a treatable tumor with fruit juices and vegan diets. Elon Musk stands out as one of the most successful tech entrepreneurs of, of our age. He's been at the forefront of online pay apps, electric cars, civilian space travel, and AI. Yet his disastrous takeover of Twitter demonstrated a serious disconnect in how Musk perceives himself versus how the public sees him. Musk asked his Twitter employees to commit to extremely hardcore work culture. In response, more than half of the workforce quit or were fired within the first few weeks. Twitter has since lost 30 million users and it's still hemorrhaging money. Musk relied on his reputation as a popular Twitter poster and all around genius to ease him into profitable buyout. Instead, he was dragged into a classism fight when he proposed making Twitter's verified checkmark, proof that a user is authentically who they claim to be. Jeff Bezos built Amazon.com into a $450 billion empire. But when he used his fortune to launch his space tourism brand, Blue Origin, he was jeered. Celebrities in science magazines mocked him for making a carnival ride for the super rich built on the backs of low-wage armies laboring in the shipping factories. Scientific American called Blue Origin an indulgent trip to space and pointed out that the passenger list was composed of super wealthy friends and TV personalities. Meanwhile, Jeff Benzos worked to market himself as a retired entrepreneur space baron. In interviews before Blue Origin's launch, Benzo showed up wearing a full body flight suit, aviator sunglasses, and a white cowboy hat. For history buffs, this was the 21st century equivalent of donning safari hats and khakis to go elephant hunting. Except Jeff made it clear he expected public applause for taking his wealthy friends to space. When journalist Steve Levy asked Benzos if his fortune might be better spent solving practical problems like poverty, Benzos doubled down on the image in his head, the adventuring space cowboy business magnate. Benzos answered, quote, You want risk-taking. You want people to have visions that most people won't agree with. If you have a vision that everyone agrees with, you probably shouldn't do it because someone else will do it first. All the real needle movers are driven by being right, when most of the world is wrong. Without irony, Benzos went on to talk about his next upcoming pet project. A 10,000 year clock he's building inside a hollowed out mountain. Which, even Benzos acknowledged, is a trivial undertaking. Boring and wasteful compared to the real problems facing humanity. But again, according to Benzos, true needle movers shouldn't follow visions of the public agrees with. They should just build big ass clocks where nobody can see them. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then, we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. Self-help books put visionary geniuses on pedestals and would generally side with Jeff Benzos and Elon Musk's anti-self-awareness stance. In fact, if we could roll all of our entrepreneur-worshipping bestsellers into Elmer's glue, stack them onto a snowman, and magically bring it to life, it would awaken with that exact quote Benzos gave his interviewer. If you have a vision everyone agrees with, you probably shouldn't do it. Real needle movers are driven by being right when most of the world is wrong. Our dancing frost would be dripping with other positive aphorisms too. From Carnegie to Covey, he would wear the same top hat as the old industrial tycoons. 
ignore public criticism. Our entrepreneur Golem would tell us, your vision is your own. Real geniuses know they're right, especially when the rest of the world thinks they're wrong. Go forth and take your rich friends to space. Buy a social media company without having all the data. Fight cancer with fruit juice. Remember, if you take advice from anyone outside, it's visionary weakness. That's our topic for this week. To get us started, we have three myths about trusting geniuses to fix everything for us. Myth one, when should geniuses stay in their lane? Or should they? If making mistakes is part of growing, is it okay to trust geniuses with half of our economy? Myth two, is there such a thing as a true renaissance man or woman? Can someone be genuinely good at everything? Can the human brain even handle that? Myth three, if asking brilliant individuals to fix our problem is immoral, like some Ayn Rand novel, then we should seek help from the wizard. Isn't it everyone's moral obligation to do their part with issues like poverty, housing, or phone adapters that take up too many slots on the power strip? We're going to get to our myths. But first, I want to tell Joe about brilliant people throughout history with unbelievably weird blind spots. This whole episode comes from... Uh... Seeing that the same circular logic that is used by CEOs and brilliant entrepreneurs to sort of shut off criticism and self-awareness, it really sounds like cult-like logic. Like the, okay, so tell me if you've ever heard this in like um, Toastmasters or like um, uh, any business class you've taken where if you know you're right and then the outside world be damned, like if you're Elon Musk... And you know PayPal is a great idea. Or if you're, you know, um, the founder of Apple and you know that the, the iPad is a great idea, then that's how you know you're right as everybody disagrees with you. Well, that's trailblazing, right? You, you saw a need that other people just didn't see. You know, and, and then probably a lot of your initial investors passed. I said, no, that's a stupid idea. Why do PayPal? If it was so great, Wells Fargo would have done it, you know, 50 years ago. Right. And the the fun thing is I can, I know that is true. Like I, I know that after reading, um, you know, we, we had five or six episodes about CEOs and we had a couple episodes about the mega rich. And I know for a fact that what makes them so successful isn't being super brilliant or genius or having an ultra high IQ. It's having an eye for, um, you know, uh, for things to not exploit like that, that is too negative of a word, but it, it's having an eye for opportunity that no one else has sort of like jumped on yet. And that is itself just a cliche to say. But well, going we, back and... We, oh, do go worship, we do worship these CEOs, though. And when people start making not millions, but billions, don't we kind of think that they're, they do have all the answers? Right, exactly. And, and when the one answer they had to do the one thing that got them all the money for their one company... When that answer doesn't work for everything else, we act confused. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, we know too from our, I don't know if you remember our Eminem, the rapper episode about when you get, you kind of insulate yourself with yes men and women. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who are way too afraid to tell you, Mr. Musk or Mr. Jobs, that you would ever do anything wrong because they're trying to remain your million dollar friend. But not even that, not even if they're your friend and they're trying to flatter you, even if you are just a normal person or, or just a relatively smart person, say you, you graduated from Stanford and you're in the orbit of Elon Musk or, or, you know, one of these super brilliant people and they tell you, yeah, this is a crazy idea, building a giant clock inside of a hollowed out mountain. But, you know, last time I did this, last time I did something that nobody else thought was going to work, it worked and made us billions. So, like, why wouldn't you trust that? And the, Fair being point. able, yeah, Fair point. <laughs> but also being able to recognize that there is a niche or lever in the economy that they can pull and keep pulling until they are wealthy. That niche or lever is not going to be attached to every problem on earth. Like, like, yeah, it's going Everyone's through had this feeling, Joe, of this person that is so unself aware, and you think, how is this person so much more successful? in every measurable part of life that I am, when they're obviously missing (laughs) 
so much. Right. <laughs> right. Like 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 our opening talked about. It's it's Steve Jobs trying to solve his cancer by having a fruit juice diet. And by the way, that's not made up. Like like that sounds crazy on our episode. If you don't if you haven't read his biography and you don't read about the people who have been in his orbit, that legit is a thing that happened. Like he he got his diagnosis. It was a highly treatable neuroendocrine cancer. It was one of the versions of it that was actually would respond to treatment. And he's like, no, nah, I got this. And like he tried to eat it. He tried to basically like vegan diet it away. I remember Paul McCartney of the Beatles. He had a girlfriend and I think she was from the Kodak or I think it was the Kodak um, family. So she's very, very wealthy. And she was a lifelong vegan, a vegetarian. And um, and she got cancer and she was afraid to tell everyone she had cancer because she thought it would reflect badly on <laughs> um, vegetarians in general. Like, oh my oh. God, she's a very... And she cared as much about that as she did that the fact that she was dying of cancer. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, she doesn't get it. <laughs> Nobody wow. cares. Yeah, no, everybody just wants you to be alive. Like, yeah, it's, you're not harming your own brand by doing what's good for you. Um, so we want to talk about the, today's episode is is there's a Greek term like the, the word genius originally in the in the original Greek. It did not mean that you are a genius of everything. Calling somebody a genius nowadays, if somebody at my job does really, really good, like they make a great sale and it kind of saves our company temporarily, everybody calls him a genius. And like we listen to his advice for everything for a while until he proves to be an idiot. Having a genius in the original Greek, it wasn't you were a genius. It wasn't like you're you're so brilliant. It was you have a genius in the same way that you have a muse or a devil. Like it is something following you around, making you extra good at something, and it can abandon you. <laughs> that is how people are, though, because people are geniuses in their own trade, right? A lot of times. Yeah. But they can lose that if they lose, you know, let's say it's a physical job and they lose their, their physical health that, that's gone, right? Right. It's It's this niche brilliance, and it only exists while you are able to operate at your peak in this very specific way. Um, yeah, like, like we said, Steve Jobs is not a medical doctor. Jeff Bezos is no better at changing a flat tire than you or I probably. Um, and, and for his like, you know, genius move of going to space, Elon Musk gets credit for pioneering more rocketry technology than Jeff Bezos basically ordered. Like he, <laughs> I imagine him picking it out on his Amazon website, by the way. I hope that's how it happened. Like it wasn't like he was in a lab. I hope he like logged into Amazon and like scrolled through all the parts coming from like different countries and then he ordered his rocket piece by piece and <laughs> I know that's not how it works but I like to pretend um but yeah even like one of his celebrity guests William Shatner was not super thrilled when he came back like did you hear about the interview with Shatner no what happened well he went up like like Bezos when he was like sending his celebrity friends to space um, one of the people he sent was Captain Kirk, William Shatner. And um, before he passed, William Shatner said, uh, quote, I discovered that the beauty isn't out there. It's down here with all of us. Leaving that behind made my connection to our tiny planet even more profound. And in another interview, he said it felt more like going to his own funeral than getting a free ride into space. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, a, that's a very prestigious group to be in. This is where all my money and success has got me. Now I'm going to die and be the laughing stock for, for the next 30 years, right? Right. Now they're, now they're throwing Kirk into a rocket into space like when they shot Spock out through a torpedo tube. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's, let's, let's burst this more, bubble. I yeah. want to unpack what he says. I, I, think, I think he's also saying that Rich and famous people aren't any more fun than us common folk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or he's even saying they're le they're least fun. They're egomaniacs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like William Slash Shatner. Yeah, he was a cool dude. Um so do you wanna could you share with us? I want I wanna just go through this with a bunch of geniuses. Let's let's pop the bubble on like all these brilliant people through history and and I think each one of them we should talk about, you know, obviously what they did amazing, what what their genius was, uh, not not 
that they were a genius. Let's talk about what their muse or demon or the genius following them around, making them good at something. Let's talk about what that was, and then just something that made them absolutely bonkers. Well, famous scientist Nikolai Tesla, um, he suffered from OCD. He, he, very obsessive, which which makes sense for any kind of inventor. I, I would say 100% of inventors are, are obsessive. Oh, um, yeah. But he believed he could communicate telepathically with his pet pigeons. He only <laughs> slept in hotel rooms um, that were divided by three. Now, OCD does not really help, doesn't really hamper self-awareness, right? It's, it's a different problem. <laughs> right. But Tesla's refusal to focus his, his brilliant mind on his own disorder or his own soft skills when he, like, when he was working at Edison's lab, he had problems communicating and getting along with everybody to the fact that Edison was underpaying him and teasing him, calling him a dumb immigrant pretty much to his face and, and making him the laughing stock of the lab. Um, he also had problems with financial literacy. He lost a lot of his patents. He lost a lot of money. And he lost a lot of credit for his invention. So he did all this work, but he didn't do all the preparation. He didn't do all the little, you know, dot the I's to get credit and get paid for all this. Another thing he used to do that I thought was really weird, Joe, was he used to, he, he was, you know, by all intents and purposes, undiagnosed with being bipolar. It was before that. But he was very depressed because of all of his problems. He used to electrocute his brain. He used to hook up these things. <laughs> that just seems so stupid to me. That seems a serious lack of, of self-awareness. I I agree, but also, like, I know that Tesla was Mr. Lightning. So if you, I mean, like, literally, it's the question of if every, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, like every problem looks like a nail. If you're the wizard of lightning, every problem must look like a lightning rod to you. Like, let's just hit it with some electricity. <laughs> Don't justify this stupidity, okay? Please. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing it, too. Now, another smart guy. I mean, this guy, you know, Einstein, synonymous with, with intelligence. Never heard of him. Go on. <laughs> he was very neglectful towards his first wife. Uh, Malivia is her name? Yeah, um, Maleva. Yeah. Maleva, is that how you say it? And I've seen things about her. She was a brilliant woman. She was the woman that, with all the things that I've seen, it looked like... She, a lot of the stuff he got credit for, she actually studied and brought to light. Um, in private letters, he called her an unfriendly, humorless creature. And then he said, I treat my wife as an employee. I cannot fire. So it's just really disrespectful talk about um, the mother of your children and, you know, <laughs> someone you supposedly right. love. For him to say that publicly lets you know that he was painfully unself-aware self-awareness right i know that everybody having a messy divorce is probably defending einstein right now but yeah the the notion that this is a guy who can figure out anything as far as space and time go but he wasn't able to you know he had to communicate this through letters which is weird and as a divorce man yeah we're not crazy about our ex-wife but we admit that we weren't perfect either and we always stand up for her ex-wife. We don't say everything. You know, she didn't say everything about him either, and I'm sure she has plenty of things to say. <laughs> right. You want to tell me about this Marie Curie? Okay, so this is one that I found was interesting. I always assumed... Okay, so um, Marie Curie was a French inventor who basically took a hammer... And crushed something called pitch blend, which is like a glass ore, and smashed it in buckets and like got the salt out of it. And this salt was radioactive. It was um, it was radium salts. And so she invented like first off, basically discovered radiation almost single handedly, and started the trend of people using radium, which is this glowing you know material. And the radium girls who used to paint watches and the radium tonics that people used to drink because they, they glowed and they got warm in your, your hand. Obviously, Marie Curie and her husband got very irradiated discovering radiation. Um, so, so they toxic levels, I'm I'm guessing. Oh, absolutely. There, there are articles about how many, asking the question, how many thousands of years will 
Murray Curry's body be irradiated? And and the answer is lots. It's it's a lot of years. But also, I used to think like I I went with the assumption that that she just didn't know that they did not know what the radiation was doing to their bodies. Like like it's like oh you're you're the first person to discover it. How could you know? Um, that's not the case. It's she was once asked by um, uh, newspaper people, like like tabloids came up to her and they were asking her questions. They're like, hey, um, the U.S. is making this stuff in factories now. In fact, they're pricing radium salts so high she couldn't continue her experiments. And they're like, what should they do? And she told them, she's like, oh, you should have regular blood tests, exercise, get fresh air, limit your contact, only allow trained people to handle it. It's extremely dangerous. And meanwhile, she is still keeping a vial of this stuff on her person at all times. It's in her pocket. It's on her bedside. She liked how it glowed. So, like, if we talk about somebody who is extremely genius, but also showing a little bit of lack of self-awareness, on this list so far, I think this is the least egregious, but also, what the hell? Like, if you if you know this is killing people and you, I mean, you're not going to carry it around, right? <laughs> Well, I, that, that's a she's it's a very interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I got one more for you, um, Dale, yeah. Car- or, Dale Carnegie. Carnegie and Rockefeller were, you know, early American billionaires, right? Two of the most successful men in in the world's history. Now, coming up, building their wealth, they did not treat employees very well. You know, Carnegie still factories it was said there was a man in there that had a gray hair on them because they usually died from accidents and rockefeller was again um he identified himself as a christian but his business practices were seen anything but christian towards the end of their life joe they went from getting every penny winning every war at all cost no matter whose life was involved to giving it all away they started to competing with each other with philanthropy, with giving away. And when all said and done, they probably gave back more than they actually earned. And I think that's an interesting. And I, I want to say this, and this is uh, from the Reengineer Jew book. Intelligence does not equal self-awareness, John. <laughs> I, I think you particularly like telling me that just to, <laughs> to put me in my place. Because you're smarter but... than me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still better than you. Because I'm more self-aware. I don't know. I don't know if I am. You're more social. I don't know if I'm either one of these. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we kind of that is that is the goal today. Is is we're gonna all become more self-aware, and we're gonna realize that intelligence and and genius is not self-awareness. It it's in fact you would think that being hyper intelligent would make it easier to be self-aware. Like oh, you can just figure yourself out at that point. Or being intelligent means you can wrap your head around the psychology articles that talk about self-awareness. Or being intelligent means you have a leg up as far as like, you know, everybody college educated should technically be able to read, you know, a a book about, you know, meditation or or knowing yourself. And that's not really the case. Like it, it takes less intelligence. It more just takes work and diligence. Conscientiousness is where the answer is. Um... So, okay, I had a <laughs> speaking of Ayn Rand, we're we're gonna jump around a little bit because we're talking about mega successful, brilliant people who displayed shocking lacks of self awareness. And one of the sort of like founding philosopher writers about being a entrepreneur, being like the objectivist is Ayn Rand. Um and she of course her philosophy was Atlas Shrugged, if you ever had to read that in high school or college the idea that um every entrepreneur they're the least selfish thing they can do is make themselves rich that that you know ayn rand's philosophy was if you are a capitalist the best thing you can do for everybody around you and your country and your family is pursue capitalism uh, pursue your interests be an entrepreneur um and through that act you will invent things you will uh, compete against, you know, other people making the same product as you. You will better your community around you by starting up factories and giving out jobs and things like that. I don't think Ayn Rand ever uh, anticipated how bad monopolies and duopolies would get and that all this stuff would go right out the window when 
like we had an episode the other week about how the hospital was charging their own employees to use the hospital, but they weren't allowed to go to another hospital for medical care because they were tied to like this crazy exclusive agreement upon entering their employment. So yeah, it, it's, I, I will say that Ayn Rand's philosophy goes right out the window with entrepreneurship when you start getting into like um, non-compete agreements at working at a burger joint. Um, but I want to ask Todd, have you ever heard of her rambly letter that she sent her niece about loaning her 25 bucks? No, I've never heard of it. <laughs> there are, it's been posted to the internet. You can find transcripts of it. But my favorite version of this is there is a, um, like a, an older actress reading it, um, live letters, I think is what it's called. And she's reading this letter where Ayn Rand, who is supposed to be like, the philosopher thinker as far as like capitalism and money goes just going on this tight-fisted miserly very concerned rant to her niece who she's never met and the niece is asking to borrow 25 bucks from her famous writer author aunt and she's just like you know she, she's saying things like you know like you know if you can pay me back the 25 dollars and you swear you can we will set up a payment schedule and you will pay it on time for these following years. If you fall sick or ill, you will agree to, you know, uh, um, we'll stop payment briefly and then you'll continue it. It sounds like she's setting up employment for this young woman. And this poor niece is like, I just want 25 bucks for a dress. Literally, I wrote about a dress. So sorry, Auntie. So sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we bring up Ayn Rand because the, the Ayn Rand answer to all of this is we should not be asking jeff bezos to solve our problems when we look at jeff bezos who is making a rocket ship and going to space on all the money he made by employing underpaid workers in amazon factories that's his business the ayn rand answer is jeff bezos is a logistics man he moves boxes from one place to another his only obligation is to keep moving boxes and to make his shareholders money um not to solve our problems uh, you know our, our worldly issues um, don't you think that this is a spiritual thing too? I mean, I think any kind of church or religious leaders, people immediately don't think of them as, you know, people like us. They think that they should be perfect and they know, they know the answers to everything, right? Because their direct connection with God, when these people are as human as we are, right? They make the same mistakes as we are, as we do. Right. So, okay. Th that's, yeah, like, the idea that he hasn't made mistakes getting to this position, that, that he is somehow higher than everybody because he has figured out box logistics and how to ship things on Amazon. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Jeff Bezos, uh, Amazon frequently has not paid taxes in whatever state they're in. They make it a habit to um, make sure not to pay taxes. Like, like, and, and they've defended this position in multiple states by simply saying that this is the agreement we wrote out with the state. And, and it's, it's a system where Jeff Bezos also famously pays um, as minimum as possible to charities. You talk about Rockefeller and Carnegie paying or, or giving, you know, vast, vast sums of money to charities and founding like the Carnegie Center and like, <laughs> yeah. you know, schools and things. Um, this is not Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is not interested in that. He has donated less than 1% of his wealth toward charities. He's doing it for taxable reasons, basically, for his own personal taxes, not for Amazon's. So to to say that Ayn Rand's answer applies to him, that he is supposedly enriching, or any of these brilliant people are enriching the place where they are setting down their business and roots, it's not that they are holding up America with their companies and factories they are riding the back of a rhinoceros as you know the bird pecks on the back like it's it's so you're telling me the richest man in the world is if he, if he accidentally gave a, a dollar too much to a charity that he wasn't benefiting benefiting from long term he would sue <laughs> he would come at them to get that money back right <laughs> just a real real sweet guy right yeah the the when I've started researching into this, the only answer I was aiming for is why is everyone upset that Jeff Bezos made himself a rocket ship for him and his friends? And then I got it really deep, really fast about how much he has avoided contributing back to the communities that he has set up shop around. And it's, it's, it's pretty wild, but um, 
Paul Piff. Uh, okay, so there's there's a social scientist that we have referenced before, Paul Piff. He did the Monopoly study that showed that if you start with more money in life and you start with more resources in life, you are more likely to blame your your own skills than luck. You, you will invent, you'll backwards invent reasons why you're being successful with the cards and dice you were given. That way you don't have to feel bad about having more than other people. Um, he did another study that talked about really fundamentally the quickest way to, you know, change the minds of folks that don't want to give back to their community or solve our peasant problems is to reconnect them with humanity just by having them have a conversation and interact with normal people again. Like he, in his studies, reconnecting with people in need or being in service to other humans, it, it broke the insulation literally within seconds. Like some of his studies was like, yeah, we, we found, you know, an exact circumstance that would do it in less than two minutes. And meanwhile, you can't get more insulated with your money than going to goddamn space with your friends. So <laughs> that's that beats shotgun on the way to school, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess I guess what this whole I, I don't know. Am I crazy? Like like the idea that if you are a mega genius entrepreneur and you have all the money, is it our, our opening statement was, should we trust geniuses to solve our problems? The first question that we are are basically not trying to bust, but just trying to confront is, is it morally okay to ask mega geniuses with lots of money to approach our problems? Or is it our problems because we're part of civilization and they're not anymore? Are they so rich that they are no longer part of society? I think they have more pull because they have more resources and they have more ability to change. I think that's the, right? Right. We just can't do the same things. We just can't that they can. You know, Paul Allen, you know, of Microsoft, he can start a business and and employ a bunch of people and fix a bunch of things based just off of his name, you know? Right. He's that powerful. That just that the fact that he's involved in it will 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 get money from all kinds of other resources, right? So I think they should be held to a higher standard because they have a bigger effect on the world. It's... And then on top of that, they don't have to pay taxes. They don't. There's a lot of a lot of benefits. And as we know, <laughs> rich and famous people don't pay for anything. They don't pay for food. They don't pay for clothes. <laughs> the rich of the rich um, will buy their neighbors' as houses and then rent them back out to them. Right. If they like them, that's how powerful they are. They they don't just own their. It's not just them. They own everything. Uh, Todd's referencing our celebrity insulation episode where we found out that if you get. Um... If you get um, popular enough, if you become a celebrity, there's a certain tipping point where you get more than $180,000 worth of free stuff per year. And it was shockingly common. And it it meant that like above a certain standard, everybody wants brand recognition with you. You get free Nikes because people want to see you wearing their Nikes. You get free cars because, you know, you're such a big name. We want to see, you know, everybody wants you. The company wants to see you driving their car as sort of a, a walking commercial. Um, and on top of that, like, so we, we, we insulate or, or, or let people who are making the decisions for all of us insulate themselves, but we also approach people to solve our worldly problems when in fact, a lot of what they're doing is kind of gambling. Like, okay, Steve Jobs mastered computers. He actually had to put in mastery hours, period, the end. He was actually a genius or had a genius. But there are some people like like Elon Musk. Did you hear about how much money he lost in 2021? Well, yeah, it's the half of half of Twitter, like overnight. I, I did read about that. I did follow that. Oh, even before Twitter. Yeah, he did. He did lose half of Twitter. He's still hemorrhaging tons of money because of that. Um, but before that. Um, in November of 2021, excuse me, he lost more money than any human had ever lost in the history of the world. Uh, he lost 180 to 200 billion um, is the best estimate currently um, because of poor performance of Tesla stocks. And he came out and said that that was correct. Like, like they, <laughs> it was speculated that this was how much he lost. And then he, he corrected everybody. He's like, yep, I have lost more than any human has ever lost in, <laughs> in dollars. 
Um, hum- that should be humbling, you would think, right? No matter how rich you are. Yeah, but that 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 just reminded me that like, you know, um, the people who are working in a lab, pressing pills together and doing chemistry, they have mastery. But the people who are oftentimes starting businesses based on the tech they're familiar with, that's more gambling than mastery sometimes. So yeah. once in a while, we need to remember that we're, you know, we're pretending entrepreneurs are Thomas Edison these days running R&D labs and that they're like mixing chemicals themselves standing over a Bunsen burner. And it's like, no, no, no. If you're Jeff Bezos, you're not testing rockets like you're Howard Hughes. Like they're not launching themselves at walls with a with a rocket going behind them and shattering their own sort of like skeleton when it stops short they are sitting in their board meetings and they are sort of like becoming space barons because it sounds fun well and i think too some of the, some of the times we we write off all of our successes to just hard work and being genius when some of it was just being exposed to something really good timing and and just a little bit of luck as well and sometimes that can go straight. I mean, you and I have had our own successes, maybe not millions or billions, but sometimes you can kind of start to think that you know something that other people don't win. <laughs> right. There's there's um uh the guy that wrote uh was it 1491, Charles Mann? He wrote another book about um basically global warming. He he tried to make it as apolitical as possible. He tried to write it to where it wasn't saying it's it's true or false he wasn't arguing political sides he was just simply saying yeah global warming's probably tr- you know actually happening um it's probably not what everybody is anticipating it's probably not what everyone's reporting in the news um but he he made a distinction he mostly wanted to say you know isn't it weird how we approach problems that we rely on two types of scientist or entrepreneur we we rely on prophets and wizards the prophet is the one that nobody likes to hear from the prophet comes forward and they say you know they're they're trying to prophesize or or foretell the future they say everyone reduce your way save power and water the earth can't sustain us all we're all going to die and the wizard is the scientist we turn to he the wizard is elon musk or or like we we think it's elon musk we think it's jeff bezos where we go to the wizard and say can you please super science us out of our every problem like we need you to grow food on the side of skyscrapers for us or create gold from water or make drought proof tomatoes or rocket ships that can launch your car into space. And, and we, we treat entrepreneurs like they are wizards. Like, like we ask them, please solve all our problems, but holy shit, this can backfire sometimes. Um, can do you do we have an example of an actual wizard? Like when we talk scientific wizards, like like I, do. I have a yeah. real life wizard, and it, he could be real popular, but he really isn't. Um, Fritz Haber 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 yeah Haber Fritz Haber, and this was a wizard with a capital W. Um, he was born in Poland to a very well-off Jewish family, and that is very important to remember. So he was a German Jew, and he was born in Poland, I think it was in the the 1860s. So he was a scientist, and what he figured out was was how to feed, um, how to use nitrogen as fertilizer. And before that, they were using bird shit and and bat dung to fertilize crops. but then he switched to nitrogen. And then the what it, what it, the term it was called, it was making bread from air. And that meant he could feed the whole world with the, his new innovations. So fertilizing crops with nitrogen. And this helped him win Nobel Prizes. Right. Before, um, if you go back and read far enough, there were people in, before Fritz Haber saying that like, 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 imagine back before the First World War, there are scientists who are like, our world can't sustain how many people we have. Our farms don't produce enough food. We're going to run out. The same kind of stuff we hear about global warming, where it's like, we're, we're not going to have enough to feed 10 billion people. It's just not going to happen. Everybody so, reduce what you're eating. And that's what they say. They say two out of five humans alive today owe their lives to this man. So it's that big. It was that big a problem. And he solved that problem. So what's the bad of this? 
So World War One starting, World War Two. He was so dead set on becoming a patriot and proving himself as a German citizen that he invented um, poisonous gas. And this would be used as a way to um, destroy other, um, during wartime, to drop on other soldiers and kill them. Now, when I was in the Army, we did studies, you know, they, they t talked to us about nerve gas and the different kind of gases. And through the years, we, we studied the history of this. These are so potent. I mean, it's it's they say it's the equivalent of, of of vomiting up your internal organs. That's how you die. What a terrible way to die. Right. right? There's um there's a hardcore history episode about the First World War with Dan Carlin, where he talks about how you would watch people drown while they're standing up in the air, like they're not going anywhere, they're not swimming, they're just standing in the trench or they're climbing out. And they're drowning in their own gas mask because they can't breathe. That's horrible. So poisonous gas. Now we're going to World War II. Now we all know what happened in World War II. So again, to show his patriotism, he was involved in um, the makeup of the gas that the genocide that, that killed millions of his own people. So where do you put him in history? Right. He won all these Nobel Prizes. He fed and saved all these lives. And then he used his power, his, his brain, for evil to be a patriot to a country that hated him. Because as anti-Semitic things started to spread, um, they started to affect him too. They didn't like him anymore either, even though he'd done all this thing for his country. That is, okay, I just had a very strange, like, I, I swear to God, I, I haven't been smoking anything, but I just realized something that he has saved so many people and so much of his nitrogen process has gone into our food. There were probably people in the gas chambers whose bodies were made up of tons of the bread and nitrogen that he his process made before they got gassed. Like, like... His chemistry was touching so much and so many lives all simultaneously. It is insane to think about that. Well, and they said the, the Nazi cancer has murdered millions, including his own extended family. So he actually killed his own family because of this. Um, and Einstein was also a Jewish German. Um, and and this was, as for his tortured relationship with Germany, he says that his life was tragic of the German Jew. A tragedy of unrequited love. So he gave his life to Germany, and Germany just kind of used him up and threw him away. That is crazy. And that's that reminds me of um, we did an episode about uh, Friedrich Sir Turner, the the guy that invented morphine. During the Civil War, we had morphine because of you know Sir Turner, but at the same time, his own country, uh, Prussia, was asking him to make better bullets. Like, like he ended up, you know, being recognized by his country, not for his contribution to medical science, which is exactly where mm -hmm. he saved the most people. It's because he tried to invent better gunpowder, basically. And that meant, and that meant more to him. And this, this Fritz, towards the end, he was on the run. He had to leave this country that he'd done all this work for. His health had failed. He died of a heart ailment at 65. But he died displaced. He died... Um, ashamed and you think of all the things he could have done with his life if he would have just pointed that been more self-aware and thought about you know all the imagine what he could have done with it. all the good guy I don't even know and I'm sure he does <laughs> his potential his let's face it his ceiling was higher than most the fact that Einstein talks about him so much should mean something right right yeah he he was a true wizard like if we talk science and then the, the you know Charles Mann's idea, the the wizard and the philosopher, that was a wizard. Like he, that he was doing literal alchemy. Like it's, yeah, I don't know. Okay, is What's it our line? intelligence does not equal self awareness? Right. <laughs> yeah. He. Oh my God. What happened to his family? If he had self awareness, like let's inject instead of injecting nitrogen. Let's inject self-awareness for a second. You know, if he had thought about his family, 
what he was working on, you know, if he wasn't so steeped in the culture of being a noble scientist working for his country. Like, he had to have known. I mean, like... Yeah. He he wasn't naive to the fact of what they were doing or what it was for. He was, he was taking people's lives in the masses the most efficiently yeah. way he could. So yeah, we, he can't plead. He can't plead ignorance. Maybe some people on his team could, you know, but not him. He knew exactly what he was doing. We're gonna we're gonna link off to an amazing episode by Radio Lab that walks through his story, and I just remember there was a moment in it where like his family started confronting him about it, bringing this up, trying to make him admit it, and like that ended tragically too. Like his immediate family said so there was like a suicide or something. It, it's it's such an awful story, but that is imagine, imagine his betrayal that he thought when he started seeing these swastikas up and the anti-Semitic stuff, and people started to look at him even in his own lab. Yeah, can you imagine the just how stabbed in the back, betrayed he must have felt? I mean, I, after everything he'd been through, after he was a celebrity, you know. Yeah, he he fed the most people on Earth. He he saved everybody from a population cap. And then he gave the most weapons to his country. And then that happens, that that backstab. Um, can we talk about... Okay, so I, I don't want to shift too much away from the wizards. Can we talk about the morality of asking scientific wizards to solve our problems? Earlier, I, I, I made the accusation that powerful businesses are not like the balloons lifting up our airship like if you if you imagine elon musk and jeff bezos and steve jobs and they're you know apple amazon and tesla you know these are the helium balloons tied and netted and they are holding up america that they're lifting us all up and i kind of made the accusation that that's not true that's what ayn rand sees what it actually is more like is these are the little white birds on the backs of elephants and rhinos. And that, you know, these birds are telling the elephant how lucky they are that they have a bird sitting on their back pecking, you know, parasites off them. Um, and I want to back that up. Like, I, I use that metaphor, but it seems mean-spirited, especially, you know, to an objectivist. Um so I, I actually went looking for instances where Amazon has set up fulfillment centers in um, unstable countries. Because I, I wanted to see, like, yeah, what happens if Amazon brings jobs to Yemen or Somalia? Or what happens if Amazon sets up a fulfillment center in a country that is considered fragile? Um, and that, you know, they, they could collapse. Like, like have they air ballooned? a company or a country have they ever set up shop specifically to to lift a, a country or an economy up um the answer is basically the, i keep thinking of delorean when he went when he took his manufacturing delorean the car company and he took it to to a real rough area of ireland that was struggling politically having civil war and everything and changed the changed the economy you know not forever but for a while Right. Okay. That's, I am so glad you said that. We don't have eight hours to get into a podcast about all the times a rich entrepreneur has done this. Ford set up uh, his own town once. Um, railroad towns have existed in America. Hershey, Hershey, Pennsylvania, the, the chocolate yeah. company. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been wealthy entrepreneurs who have tried to build up economies, who have tried to basically like show up and set up a, a town or a system or basically play um, city planner, it never ends well. Um, and I found out that you have to have a healthy economy uh, to support an Amazon fulfillment center. <laughs> you have to have a healthy economy for any of these, um, you know, mega entrepreneurs to yeah, set up shop. The people that live town. there still have to work off, they have to still live off some kind of government support because they don't make enough in their full-time <laughs> job. <laughs> Right. Yeah, he doesn't pay him enough to to sustain a you know any kind of apartment or house or anything apartment house car or anything. 
There, there are only 195 countries in the world. You have to go farther than 30 down on the list of like, if we're talking most fragile to least fragile, you got to go more than 30 down before you start finding any countries that even have an Amazon fulfillment center. Not, not just corporate headquarters, not just a, you know, a uh, um, major center of commerce or, or you know, a, a skyscraper, just a fulfillment center. You, you have to be down to like, um, was it Pakistan, I think. So, yeah, no, the, these are not the, the image in our minds of, you know, mega entrepreneurs, the, the, the wizards and the geniuses lifting up the economy with their brilliance. That's not the case. It's they need that stability to to run their system. Um, and we need educated people to do it. Like like if if I were to pick out the one thing that they could contribute to when when uh, at our opening, when Jeff Bezos said, you know don't do things that other people think you should do because somebody else has gotten there first and they're doing it too. Like, like his quote about, you know, uh, needle movers, real needle movers. Um, they know to go their own way. Basically the one thing they could actually contribute to that we are absolutely certain would help the economy and thus help them as well is education. Um, right now, America is number five for the most educated people. Uh, like the, the most educated country, America is down to number five, which means we're still economically competitive with other, you know, first world nations. But there's a problem with that. That's um, the cohort of 55 to 64 year olds. We're no longer in the top 10 when we talk about 25 to 34 year olds. Like our, our most competitive educated sector is the baby boomers. Um Millennials got degrees at shocking rates. Like they beat everybody as far as the the need to get a degree, but it was out of pure necessity. So like we're we're going to have boomers retire and then we're going to slip a little bit farther as far as most educated countries because we don't have a free education system. That's not communism. That's just competitively to other countries that do have you know, uh, socialist systems. Like, I'm not trying to take a political side. I'm just simply saying that because we don't offer free college, we are economically going to be lower on that list uh, of most educated nations, meaning we'll be less competitive and we won't be able to support as many Amazon wish fulfillment centers if that's our goal. Um, okay, there's also something else I want to get to. You mentioned Tesla or, or yeah, um, Nikola Tesla, the Wizard of Menlo Park. No, was that Edison? Uh, Edison's the Wizard of okay. <laughs> Menlo Park. Tesla worked for him, for invented a lot of things. and did get credit for him because he didn't fill up all the Forbes. <laughs> right. And nobody liked him because he was depressed all the time. <laughs> so that's that's something I thought of. I was just thinking about like, you know, um, mega geniuses who have invented cool stuff and it, it trickled out to the rest of society and, and boosted everybody up. I was trying to think of stuff that Amazon has invented that wasn't just box moving. I don't, I'm sorry, this whole episode has turned into me kicking sand in at, at <laughs> Amazon, but um, yeah, they invented the Alexa and the Kindle and like a good logistics system. They move boxes, but like I realized all their electronics brick, like they become useless if you try to use them independently of Amazon as a network. Whereas most of the inventors on our list that we've talked about, that's not true. Like their inventions are like everybody uses them and mm -hmm. can continue using them. Yeah, it, it's not. It's, he's just buying other. He's just buying other businesses. You know, he buy Whole Foods and stuff. It's already 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 set up. <laughs> right. And and don't worry if anybody's worrying that um, that these billionaires are giving too much to charity that they're making it easy on the rest of us. Um, Forbes has a list of like top 400 the, the the top 400 the top 400 as far as like most wealth most successful ceos um the people who give one percent or less jeff bezos and elon musk are at the top of that list <laughs> so they're they're not worrying about they're they're giving just enough to get their tax break basically um but the largest cohort of the top 400 lands in that the the people who give one percent or less so the 400 most successful, most paid CEOs on earth, they're, they're, they're not giving that much. I think it'd be fun to do a, a Fortune magazine or 
Forbes magazine based on where they give their money away to because they might not be giving it to charity, but they're probably for social status buying certain art and donated to certain ballets and certain art. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, there's they, a bunch of people on this list stepping too. over starving people on the street on their way to their to their um to the performances that's been named after them because they gave so much money to that institution. Yeah, they're giving it to uh, each other's philanthropical organizations and who knows where they're giving their money to because oftentimes I mean we had the um we had an episode where we covered philanthropy in general and we found out that a lot of them they don't have to give all of their money to needy or the organization they're claiming either um less than 50 people on this top 400 list by the way gave five to 20 percent and the billionaires that gave 20 percent or more of their wealth away there was only 10 of them and like warren buffett and george soros on that list that's pretty much it like it's <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're talking about how carnegie and rockefeller gave away almost all their money or more than half or just insane amounts yeah there's like there's only 10 billionaires who are giving away you know even a fifth of their their wealth which i'm not saying they need to it's theirs they can do whatever they want but it's i mean like i said they're they're the white bird on the back of a rhino they're not actually yeah they're not the the air balloons lifting us all up that we give them credit for i think that's a great way to end your life though don't you think as opposed to giving it all to your family we, we did an episode on inheritances and how the vast majority of them are pissed away by by the family in less than three generations yeah yeah so it's better just to <laughs> give them give them a little and then give the world a lot It'll require real work and investment to stabilize the American economy again. We need genius to invent better, sustainable methods of living. And the foresight of scientists like Alexander Fleming, who decided not to patent penicillin so it could reach more people. But we're not asking the Flemings and Habers to fix our problems. Instead, we're asking the barons of space to spare some of their wealth, to reinvest it into the stability they've relied on. But according to Forbes and US tax records, geniuses on the caliber of Benzos and Musk don't pour their brilliance into just one specialty. They split their genius into two buckets, the skill that made them rich and the complex system of money to keep from paying their dues. When Jeff Benzos talks about being a needle mover, the needle he really wants to move is the second hand on this giant mountain clock. The needle reminding everyone 10,000 years from now that he existed. He shipped boxes in a very prosperous economy and got wealthy from it. Because the needle on a giant mountain clock is a lot easier to move than the gauge on American poverty. Inequality, housing, and food aren't just tough issues to solve. They're boring. Nobody cares when a wealthy person donates to a worthy cause outside of tax season. And maybe that's the real problem. Maybe we should all ignore the next genius who takes their friends to space on a private rocket or loudly buys up social media company for fun. Maybe if we only give airtime to scientists who cure cancers or retweet about people who quietly give billions to world hunger, how would that change the focus of our high-profile geniuses. You've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com. That's where we have research links, show notes, feedback, and blog articles for each episode. We're not experts in anything. We've got an opinion on everything.